Good morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our first session of the day. Uh, we have a real treat in store for us. Uh, hopefully you're here for Benello with uh, Ms. Sharon McCarthy. For those of you who know her, uh, this woman needs no introduction, but it is my pleasure to uh, offer a short uh, bio for Sharon today before she starts the presentation. Sharon McCarthy is a wine educator for Banffy Vintners and is a nationally respected food and wine consultant. She's a certified specialist of wine and past president of the Society of Wine Educators. Sharon is a recipient of our American Wine Society uh, Award, Mer Award of Merit winner. She was, uh, she was given that award in 2015 and even more importantly, was recognized by the Italian government for her efforts and in inducted into the Wines of Italy's Hall of Fame. Sharon is affectionately known as America's First Lady of Wine Education and has played an instrumental role in including America in introducing Americans from all walks of life to the finer, more nuanced appreciation for the fruit of the vine. Please welcome me virtually in welcoming Miss Sharon McCarthy. Thank you so much, Leanne. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm so excited to be presenting Brunello di Montalcino today. And um, we, we actually have uh, three wines. We're going to be tasting Chantenay Rosso di Toscana, which isn't part of the Brunello family, but I do have a method to my madness, and you'll hear about that in a moment. We have Rosso di Montalcino, which is indeed Brunello's younger brother. And then, of course, we have our classic Brunello di Montalcino. Along the way, I know that um, Katie and Diane and, and Leanne are going to look at questions that we um, might uh, uh, get from you and try, try to stop me along the way. You, most of you already know me and I go on and on and on. We've got a lot of information to share. I have a PowerPoint as you can see in front of you. Um, at the end of the program, if anybody would like this PowerPoint, I'm happy to share it with you. If there's any other information that you want or need, um, please feel free to ask. Maybe you can use this all or part of it for um, chapter events and feel free to use it. The only thing we usually ask is that you just give us credit for the presentation. But today, I'm here to talk about Brunello di Montalcino. And I call it bewitching, beguiling, bewildering. It bewitches us with the history of this extraordinary wine, which is considered one, if not Italy's finest red wines. It's beguiling because when you taste this wine, it beguiles you, it seduces you to go back into that glass again and again. And it's bewildering because there's so much to learn about Brunello, the wine laws, and the great variety Sangiovese that goes into the production of this wine. We're starting out here in Italy, in Tuscany. Tuscany is one of Italy's 20 regions. Tuscany, as you can see on this map in the center, and then you can see on the Italian map exactly where Tuscany is located. It's located in central Italy. And Tuscany takes its name from the Etruscans. The Etruscans were actually a tribe of people who we still, to this day, 3,000 years later, don't know too much about. We know that the Etruscans lived in what we now know as Tuscany and gave Tuscany its name. They lived from about um, 900 BC to about 200 AD when they were assimilated into the Roman population. But the most interesting thing about the Etruscans is we know today that it was the Etruscans who taught not only the Romans, but the French, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, how to make wine. And this region, Tuscany, is one of Italy's 20 regions. Italy is a country that's made up of 20 regions, 18 on the Italian peninsula, and then the two largest islands in the Mediterranean, which are Sicily and Sardinia. 
And these regions can be likened to our states. In Italy, they call them regions. Um, here in the US, we call them states. This is the town of Montalcino, which gives this great wine, Brunello, its name. This is a fortress town with an extraordinarily long history. Castello Banfi, whose wines we're going to be tasting today, is located as the crow flies about 20, 25 minutes south of the town of Montalcino. And I was on, I, I've been um, so interested in conference and all of the presentations, and I've been so excited. Um, starting with uh, Bartholomew Broadbent, I knew his father, so it tells you how old I am. Um, uh, Bartholomew Broadbent um, with Chateau Moussard. I had met Serge uh, Hashar um, years and years ago. I thought that was fascinating. Mark Davidson was superb with uh, Shiraz from Australia. I found that so fascinating. And last night, I loved the interaction on the happy hour. And I did hear at the happy hour that you wanted to start tasting the wines a little bit earlier. So here we go. We're going to start off with Chantenay. Chantenay Rosso di Toscana. Chantenay Rosso di Toscana is a blend of the Brunello grape variety, Sangiovese, along with about 20% Cabernet Sauvignon and another 20% Merlot. Why do I have Chantenay in this presentation? The reason why I have this delightful red blend that's quaffable, has high quality, but we say Chantenay for every day, is because this wine, who I liken to, and our team, by the way, I have to thank our team in Italy for so many of the slides that you're seeing today, because they put um, these together for a presentation that they did for um, the American team, and it was so exciting. And they um, likened some of the Brunellos and the wines in our portfolio to typical Italian cars. So I'm gonna start off with, this is a is typical of a Cinquecento. Cinquecento has high quality, but it's, it's fun and fresh. And um, when you look at that car, you always smile. When you look and you taste our Centene, you always smile. Centene Rosso di Toscana today, but guess what? Back in the day, this was called Chantenay Rosso di Montalcino. When we first started out in 1978, we began producing different wines on the estate. And one of the wines that we began producing was a Rosso di Montalcino. We named our Rosso di Montalcino after one of the farmhouses on our estate, which still today exists, still today is called Chantenay because the grapes were growing around the farmhouse. Back in the day, when we came out with Centenay Rosso di Montalcino, it was, as the wine is today, very fresh, fruity, very quaffable. You have to realize that the wine laws for Rosso di Montalcino, which is Brunello's younger brother, require only a, a 12 months of age no wood requirement. And back in the day, most producers, Banfi included, created a Rosso di Montalcino, which was light and fresh, breezy on the palate, and was drunk a year after bottling. However, a few years into our Brunello production, John Mariani Jr., our chairman emeritus today, decided that he wanted a Rosso di Montalcino that was more closely aligned to the older brother, that had a little bit more intensity, a little bit more pizzazz on the palate. I hope you're tasting this Centenay because our Centenay has always had the same characteristics, luscious berry and ripe cherry on the nose that followed through on the palate very quaffable, a great vein of acidity, 
you've got a little bit of an herbaceous character, a little touch of plums on the palate, but this is a wine, as we say, Chantenay for every day. And this was the original style of our Rosso di Montalcino. When this was first born as a Rosso di Montalcino, it was, of course, by law, 100% Sangiovese. Over the I years, have when. A question for you. Yes. All right, Gasper wants to know if the Sangio used for Chantenay is the same clone used for Brunello. Very good question. We have now on our estate, um, the newer vineyards are being planted to um, a, a maximum of 15 clones that we've registered. The majority of new vineyards that are planted on our estate are three clones. Chantenay, some of the Chantenay is from older vineyards that had a mass or massal selection, but some of the vineyards include now the special clones, Janus 50, Janus 10, and BF 30 that we're using for our Brunello. So yes, we are using some of our studied Brunello clones, but we do have some portions of the estate that still have some older vines that were based on the mass selection before we started studying clones of Sangiovese. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about the clones of Sangiovese that we've um, studied and, and what we found. So this Chantenay is light, breezy, quaffable. And just remember, the reason I put it in this, this program was that this was the style of Rosso di Montalcino that we first produced. Even though it was produced with 100% Sangiovese, what we wanted to do is keep that style over the years. And we started blending some Cabernet and Merlot with it. Today, our Chantenay Rosso, as it started out, has this liveliness, this great vein of acidity. It spends just a few months in small French oak barrels, just to give it a little bit of pizzazz on the palate. But Chantenay Rosso di Toscana was our original Rosso di Montalcino until the new, newer label, which has our iconic um, uh, night on our Rosso label that follows suit on our Brunello label. Until that wine was born, when John in the early 80s, John Mariani Jr. decided that he wanted our Rosso di Montalcino to be more like the older brother. We had already had such great success with Chantenay that we didn't want to give that Chantenay success up. So we declassified Chantenay to a Rosso di Toscana and we created a new wine, as you'll taste today, more closely aligned to its older brother. Montalcino. Can I interrupt you? Yes, yeah, sure. When were the CS and Merlot vines planted on the estate? And what is the percentage of grapes in the Centine mix? Yeah, in the in the Chantenay, in the Chantenay blend, we have 60% Sangiovese, which is our Brunello grape. We have 20% Cab and 20% Merlot. When we started out in 1978, we began planting not only Sangiovese and Moscadello, which were the two grape varieties that were originally planted in the Montalcino area. But we had had um, scientists, uh, ampelographers, we had had winemakers coming in from all over the world, like Emile Penel from Bordeaux to help us, um, Helmut Becker from Geisenheim. We had uh, Cornell uh, Geneva Station come in and help us. We had um, professors Owen Olmo um, from the University of California, Davis, working um, with us. And everybody to a one said that with the different soil types we had on our property, 29 different soil types, 100 different microclimates, we should try growing other grapes. And we did from the outset, from the very beginning, we started plantings of grapes as different as uh, Merlot, Cab, Syrah, 
uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Grigio, when everybody told us, oh, you can't do that, it's, it's not going to work. Um, we, we did that. We did experimental plantings, and we're proud to, to say today that those experiments paid off, and now those grape varieties are actually allowed by law to be planted in Montalcino, not just in our vineyards, but in all of the Montalcino area. And we were at the forefront of bringing those grapes in. Montalcino is interesting. Montalcino um, possibly takes its name from um, Mons Lucinus, which some people say was named after the goddess Lucina, and it was the Mount of Lucina. Instead, others refer to the fact that it may have come, the name Montalcino may have come from Mons Ilcinus. Ilcinus is um, the word for the Italian home oak. And if you look at the um, Montalcino banner, it has the home oaks as part of its banner. So some people suggest that Montalcino probably came from Mons Ilcinus which meant the mountain of the home oak. Um, for centuries, Montalcino was a stronghold and battled everyone. They battled the French, they battled the Spaniards, and they battled themselves. Um, Florence took over, Siena took over. Um, but through it all, eventually during the Middle Ages, grapes began to be produced here and regulations were set forth for the production of wine in 1553, telling producers when they could begin to harvest their grapes. In 1744, Charles Thompson said that Montalcino was not uh, particularly um, uh, favored except for the goodness of its wines. Brunello di Montalcino, as you're going to see shortly, um, traces its roots to the 19th century, to the 1800s, when local farmers, in fact, Ferruccio, beyond, uh, Ferruccio excuse me, Clemente Sante, began experimenting with a local grape variety and cultivating that in the territory. Here is a timeline which our team in Italy put together for the um, production of Brunello. As I mentioned, in 1865, it was Clemente Sante who came in. And you know, before 1865, people would blend different grapes together to make a wine. He realized that there was this grape variety that was known locally as Brunello, or the uh, grape variety was Sangiovese, and the locals began calling it Brunello. He knew that there was something spectacular about this and began studying it. In 1888, his grandson, um, Ferruccio Biondi Santi, presented the first vintage of the wine that was called Brunello di Montalcino at the Milan Wine Fair. In 1906, um, Riccardo Pacanini um, wrote about Brunello production and saying that after two years in oak barrels, the wine could be bottled. By 1966, the first regulation for um, Brunello di Montalcino as a DOC came about. The Consorcio, which is the um, group that promotes, the group of producers that promotes the production of wines in Italy. There are various consortios throughout Italy for the production of um, myriad wines. The Consorcio um, del Vino Brunello di Montalcino was established in 1967. There were 25 founding members. Today, there are over 220 members of the Consorcio. 1978 was when Banfi went into Montalcino. 1980, Brunello became the first DOCG in Italy. It was announced on October 1st, I'll never forget the day, announced in the morning, October 1st, um, 1980. That afternoon, Barolo was announced as the second DOCG. Rosso di Montalcino is really interesting. 
Rosa di Montalcino, we all know, is the younger brother of Brunello. Rosso di Montalcino, though, was not called Rosso di Montalcino until 1983. In 1980, in 1981, 1982, this wine, Brunello's younger brother, was called on labels of wine that was bottled, Rosso de Vignetti di Brunello di Montalcino. And what that means is Rosso from the vineyards of Brunello di Montalcino. The Italian government came to the producers in 1982 and said to all of us, if you will change the name of the wine on your label, we will give it a DOC. What did that mean? It meant that in 1980, 81 and 82, that wine, Rosso de Vignetti di Brunello di Montalcino, was a table wine. And the producers all banded together and said, yes, we feel that the DOC is going to give this wine status. So in 1982, it was agreed by the producers that with the 1983 vintage, they would remove the words de Vignetti di Brunello and call the wine simply Rosso di Montalcino. So even though it was produced prior to that, it had a different name. It was called Rosso di Vignetti di Brunello di Montalcino. In 1983, it was given its own DOC. In 1990, Brunello was an extraordinary vintage. We had had really good vintages before, but 1990 was considered one of the most extraordinary of all Brunello vintage. By um, 1996 and 1998, they started reviewing the rules and regulations. Back um, in 1966, when the first regulation um, for Brunello came about, the aging for that wine was required by law four years in wood. Four years in wood when you were using newer oak, which became Derriere um, in the 90s. The wine tasted like you were pulling splinters out of your mouth. It was so tannic. So over the years, what happened is they lessened the regulations, not for the total amount of four years of aging before the wine could be released, but the total amount of aging that was required in wood went from the original four years down to what we know today as two years in wood followed by another two years of age before the wine can be released. And that two years of age doesn't start until uh, January 1st of the year following the harvest. So it's really in the fifth year um, before those wines may be released by law. As I mentioned, um, 66 was the DOC, 1967, the consortio was founded. And today, 2020, we have not quite 250 members, but close to 250 members. Brunello equals Sangiovese. And you see on the bottom of this page, it says Sangiovese Grosso. I'm gonna X that out. Brunello is the local name for the Sangiovese grape variety grown in Italy specifically grown here, not only in Tuscany, but in the Montalcino area. When I started in the wine business in 1978, people talked about the fact, and they wrote about it, and they're still writing about it today, that there are two different clones of Sangiovese, that there's a clone up in the Chianti area called Sangiovese Piccolo. It makes a lighter styled wine. And there's a clone called Sangiovese Grosso in the Montalcino area that is a thicker skin, a bigger berry, and that's called Sangiovese Grosso. After 42 years of research at Castello Banfi with researchers from all over the world, including the University of Milan, the University of Pisa, Trentino Alto Adige, San Michele Al Adige, we have found that that is entirely false. Even though producers today 
still refer to the Sangiovese in Montalcino as Sangiovese Grosso. It really refers more to the fact that there's a family of clones that are grown in the Montalcino area. It isn't that they have thicker skins or larger berries. In fact, I'm quite to the opposite. Sangiovese Grosso was most producers today will agree, referring to the fact that when you took Sangiovese and you grew it in the area of Montalcino, you produced a bigger, more powerful, longer lived wine than those same clones grown in other places. And we've got a lot of research and anyone who wants it, I'm happy to send it to you. What we found was when we went in in 1978 and brought in all of these scientists, all of these people from nurseries, we found that in Montalcino alone, there were more than 650 different clones of Sangiovese growing. When we asked what were the best, nobody could tell us because nobody had ever done those studies. Small producers like Biondi Santi had done studies, but they kept that information to themselves. They had their own clones that they were using. They had, they had, they had done studies in the vineyards, but nobody, no one private producer had ever gone out and studied these different clones. What we did was we isolated 180 of what were conceived to be or considered to be the best of the Sangiovese clones. We planted those two rows at a time in our vineyards. And if you came to visit us in the early 1980s through the 90s, we had these small fermenters that we were using, stainless steel fermenters. They looked like washing machines that we were fermenting those two rows at a time. And what we found was amazing, that there was no super clone of Sangiovese, that there were clones that had different characteristics, some good, some bad, some good in good vintages, some bad in good vintages. And what we did was we isolated from 180 down to 15 of the, what we felt were the best clones. And what we did was we shared all of that information with everyone at no cost to them. We registered those clones. Everybody told us we were crazy because why did we wanna share that information that we spent millions of dollars um, producing? Why did we wanna share it with everyone? And John Mariani, who is our chairman emeritus said, all ships rise with the incoming tide. We wanna do it because we wanna keep Brunello at the extraordinary level that wine has achieved. We, we want to share our information so everybody can make better wines. The production rules for Brunello are today that the wine has to be made with 100% Sangiovese. The maximum yield per acre is eight tons per hectare. Seven tons per hectare if you have a single vineyard wine. Production area is the historic area part of the municipality of Montalcino. And you saw that on the map that I showed you on a couple of different slides. Bottling may only be done within the production area. The wine must age for a minimum of two years in oak, and then it has to age in the bottle for four months. Well, if you add two years and four months together, you don't get the um, uh, four years of aging. All together, the wine, it might, it might be two years in, in oak, then maybe people will put it back in stainless, maybe they'll put it in cement vats, but for the aging process, the wine has to age for a minimum of two years and a minimum of four months in the bottle for the classic Brunellos and six months in the bottle for Reserva. Why the minimum age in bottle? Because what they're saying is they want the tannins to soften a bit. If that wine's been aging for four years, you put it in the bottle and then you send it to somebody to drink, it would still be like pulling splinters out of your mouth. What you want to do is put that in the bottle by law for a minimum of four, six, some producers even 12 months in the bottle to help 
those tannins soften to help that wine um, uh, uh, become more palatable. Now, Brunello cannot be sold before January 1st of the fifth year following harvest. Reservas may not be sold until January 1st of the sixth year following harvest. And um, you can see, uh, I don't know if you're able to see on this particular slide, but the formats include half bottles, the smallest size is a half bottle. We don't allow bottling in 187s, and then the largest size is an 18 liter bottle. Um, vintage quality stars. This isn't an individual producer. But since 1978, what the consortio has been doing is identifying how they feel the vintages are. A one star or a zero star means that it was a terrible vintage. A one star means that the vintage was okay, but not any great shakes. You can see a one star vintage in 1984. Very few people made Brunello in 1984. Two Actually, star vintage, yes, go ahead. time for a few questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I had the first one, um, any full cluster fermentation in Chintin? Uh, no, there's no full cluster fermentation in any of our wines. No full cluster fermentation in the Rosso di Montalcino, nor in the Brunello di Montalcino either. So um, here you're seeing the various stars. A four star is a very good vintage. A five star is an extraordinary vintage. And you can see in the last five years, we have had extraordinary vintages. 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018, 2019. Out of that, we've had three five star vintages and two four star. Brunello for us is a wine that should be complex, full bodied with a dry, fresh taste. Different areas throughout the, um, the zone produce different styled wines. What we have is the Northeast and the Northwest. When you, when you look at the Northern part of Montalcino, which lies above the town itself of Montalcino, you tend to have cooler, a slightly cooler climate. And what you get from those wines tends to be a slightly paler color. You have balance, you have elegance, you have stylishness. But as you come further south and you get some of the warmer areas, you get wines that have more intensity of color, uh, wines that are bolder, more powerful, and round. Here is just a, a quick overview. We say that the Northeast, due to its location, gets those north winds and lowers the temperature significantly, especially from the temperature in the Southwest. Southwest is where Costello Banfi is located. So we say that the wines in the Northeast have an austerity to them. They have a lighter body, but they have superb elegance. The Northwest, you still have that Northwest, that cooling wind, and it carries the sea breeze that gives the wines more of a savory or a salty character. This wine is lighter because of some of those breezes, but it's very fragrant and it has elegance and balance. In the Southeast, you have um, slopes that face Mount Amiata. Mount Amiata prevents the Scirocco winds from coming up from Africa. And what happens is Mount Amiata is the highest altitude in all of Tuscany. The wine produced here has finesse. It also has complexity and very long ageability. In the Southwest, our average temperatures are higher during the day. However, we do at Costello Banfi get some of those mitigating or cooler breezes because we don't have a lot of hillsides blocking our view, if you will, of the Mediterranean. Here though, the Brunellos tend to be a little bit more muscular 
they tend to be a little bit richer, and they've got that same complexity that you find throughout the Montalcino area, and they have some really interesting perfumes. We okay. say that, and I'm, I'm not sure if you can um, see this slide, but the ranking of producers. Um, Costello Banfi is the leading producer in acreage right below us, and I think we have 179 hectares. Right below us is Fresco Valdi um, with 163 hectares for the production of the wines. You'll notice that on this um, map here, you have producers as well as hectares of um, vineyards. The hectares are in blue. There are Karen, no ask, more. Just to go ahead. A few questions. I'm sorry, I'm trying. Um, uh, do you think that global warming is contributing to the uh, streak of outstanding vintages? Absolutely, absolutely. And the fear is that uh, 10, 20 years down the road, um, it might be a little bit too warm to um, uh, produce um, the same quality grapes that we have. And just recently, the Italian government allowed for higher vineyards for where Mon uh, Brunello may be produced. It used to be limited to, I think it was 250 um, meters above sea level. They're allowing us to go higher because the higher you go, the cooler it gets. So that definitely global warming <clears throat> is having um, a, a, great, um, a great effect on the production of the wines. And definitely one of the reasons why we're getting bigger, bolder wines with higher alcohol over the years. So um, what we have here, I just wanna, uh, let's, let's go back to this slide. Um, if you see at the bottom of this slide, if you can see it on the page, you'll notice that the split of sales among um, Italian producers from Montalcino and then Banfi, 40% um, of the total production of Brunello that we produce um, is sold in Italy. 18% of our production is sold in the United States. We bring in probably about um, six or 7,000 cases of um, Brunello to the United States each year. And then 42% of our production that is at Banfi is sold um, throughout the rest of the world. You can see that a lot of the other producers, they have a slightly higher average of Brunello sold in the United States. And that's why you can see Cap um, Caparzo as the number nine um, producer of Brunello in the Montalcino area. They sell more Brunello di Montalcino in the United States than Banfi does. They usually sell between eight and 9,000 um, cases a year where we only sell usually between six or 8,000 um, maximum for the production of our wines. So now um, this is, um, his, can yes, I go ahead. ask one more question? Um, sure. How many uh, producers or wineries are making Brunello de Montalcino today? 250. We have 250 producers and we have um, a, an additional um, a number of uh, grape growers that number probably about 50. So just under 300 producers and growers of um, Brunello di Montalcino. And there is no new land. You can go out and you can buy land and you can plant with Sangiovese, but you are not allowed to call it Brunello di Montalcino unless you buy the rights because the rights are gone. There is no more, um, you, can, you can purchase land, but there are no more rights to produce Brunello di Montalcino. So you could grow Sangiovese, you could produce other wines, but unless you buy the rights from an older producer, somebody who's retiring, doesn't have any family to um, give that winery to, you can't make there, there are no new plantings of Brunello di Montalcino, additional plantings. You can buy the rights from an old producer. They have to rip up their vines and then you can plant, 
but only with those rights. So um, they are the strictest, um, among the strictest wine laws in the world. Thank you. Uh, oh, does, Banff, does Banff buy in from other Montalcino vineyards? Um, no, um, as a matter of fact, other Montalcino vineyards basically, um, uh, there are some people who are buying some of our grapes, but no, we, we have enough um, Brunello that we don't need to buy from other producers for Costello, Banfi, Brunello di Montalcino. That's all estate grown and um, bottled. And what I have is, I don't know if you can um, see this. This is our bottle of Brunello di Montalcino. Whenever you see this um, stamp, the embossed stamp with the um, uh, Costello Banfi logo on the bottle, um, this refers to the fact that all the grapes that go into the production of this wine come from our own vineyards. So only those bottles are that are estate wines all 100% carry the seal of approval. You see this on our Brunello, on our Rosso di Montalcino. Our Chantenay is, uh, does come from mostly our vineyards, but we do buy grapes from other people. So Banffy was founded back in 1919 by John Mariani Sr. And he's depicted on the left-hand side, upper left-hand corner of this. He was born in Connecticut, but when he was very young, his father passed away and his mother decided that she was gonna return home. That was Italy. She went to live with her sister who was depicted here below her uh, nephew, John. And she was Teodolinda Banffy. She was head of the household for Cardinal Ratti of Milan, who became Pope Pius XI. As head of the household, she bought all the um, food and wine for the Cardinal and then later the Pope. It was said when young John emigrated back to the United States in 1919, he took a small sum of money from his mom, but more importantly, all of his Aunt Teo Delinda Banffy's contacts. And he started an importing company, named it after his aunt, and the rest is history. John had three children, John Jr., Harry, and Joan. And when the two boys graduated from college, they were invited into the family business. John Jr. invited his daughter, Christina, into the family business when she graduated from college. And today she is our proprietor, CEO, and president of the company. And I started with Banffy back in 1978. I've watched her grow up. I started, when I started, um, she was six or seven years old and she would come into the office with her father. She was always interested in what was going on in the business. She has an older sister, Diana, who's wonderful. She's lovely, but she was never as interested in the business as Christina was. So Christina's taken over the um, reins of the company. This is a topographic map. You can see Montalcino in the, um, uh, if you took, put this on the side, it would be to the northeast of us, Siena um, to the north of Montalcino. Um, Montalcino and Siena, about 45 minutes drive apart. Um, Costello Banfi from Montalcino, as I mentioned, as the crow flies, 20 to 25 minutes. One of the interesting things about this topographic map is, notice that all of these higher hillsides um, in front of the Montalcino area, we really have an opening where Costello Banfi lies um, to the Mediterranean Sea. So we do get some of those cooling breezes and we do tend to be um, you know, a, a few degrees cooler than some of the other parts of Montalcino. This is um, Costello Poggio alla Mora and some of the old timers like me with American Wine Society will um, remember my mentor, my best friend in the world, Lucio Soray. Um, Lucio taught me everything I know about wine. And I remember the first time going to Castello Banfi and driving up to this castle, which was built on Etruscan ruins from the third and fourth century BC. Lucio said, it ain't much, but it's home. Oh my God. And I think of that every time I visit the castle, even though we bought the property in 1978, we certainly didn't build the castle. The castle was um, built um, from about the 1300s through the 1500s, 1600s, and is still being worked on today. We're very proud of the fact that 
we were the first winery in the world to um, achieve um, uh, three different uh, statuses. We were recognized for exceptional environmental, social, and ethical responsibility and leadership and customer satisfaction. We, um, we care about what we do. I was with Banfi in 1978 when the boys, John and Harry, bought this property. I can tell you, we weren't welcomed with open arms. The Italians didn't want us. We were Americans and we were noted for my favorite wine in the world, which is Rianetti Lambrusco. We were noted as the marketers. And there are still, I still have some of the old publications in my office in Old Brookville that translated from Italian say, Americans to make sweet fizzy Brunello. That was never our intention. These people thought we were gonna come in and we would make a style of Brunello like Lambrusco. Our philosophy has always been to take the traditions of the past, blend them with the innovations of the present to make wines for the future. And if you haven't tasted the Rosso di Montalcino or poured that yet, please pour it into your glass and do taste it now. Rosso di Montalcino is indeed Brunello's younger brother. Brunello di Montalcino is why the Mariani family went to Tuscany in 1978 to develop this property, not just develop it as a winery, but we want it to be part of the history and the culture. And what we've done to that extent is that we have created a beautiful resort. It's 14 suites. Um, it, Condé Nast called us one of the top resorts in Europe, photos travel, one of the world's 10 best luxurious wine resorts in the world. We're part of Relais Chateau. Um, travel and Leisure called us the top uh, resort, six, number six top resort hotel in Italy. We're very proud of all of these accolades, but we're probably most proud of the fact that, and I'm trying to um, move to this slide, that yes, we have a beautiful property, but we're luxury rooted in sustainability. When we started out in 1978, sustainability was not a word. It wasn't a word. What we did was we called what we were doing dynamic development. What did that mean? It meant that even though we purchased 7,100 acres of land, we only dedicated 2,200 of those to the vine. Why? Not, we're not stupid. We could have planted on five or 6,000 of those acres. But when we brought in all of these um, scientists, all of these greats from wineries all over the world, they told us if we wanted to be sustainable, it wasn't sustainable then, if we wanted to make wines with less chemicals, less synthetics, less pesticides, less herbicides, less SO2 in the production of our wines, we had to allow mother nature to come in and with her, she would bring the good pest to eat the bad pest. How do you best do that? You best do that by allowing the land to be fallow, not planting as much to the vine. So we love to say today that we are luxury rooted in sustainability. We are so proud of the fact that we have one of the highest ratios of forest to cultivated land among European, not just Italian, but European wine estates. We have olive trees, plum trees, we grow wheat, spelt, you name it, only less than one third of our land is planted to the vine. And that's what makes us unique. We're a constellation of single vineyards. We've researched these clones and the clones we started from the ground up, how we could make a better Brunello di Montalcino using what mother nature gave us, this extraordinary grape variety, San Giovese. But we didn't stop there. We said, how can we make an even better wine? In 1865, in 1888, when Bian di Santi came out with Brunello di Montalcino, he didn't have stainless steel fermenters, but guess what? In 1971, people like Piero Antonori brought stainless to Tuscany in Italy and put stainless in their wineries. 
Why? Because it created wines that were fresher, fruitier, livelier, even longer lived on the palate. But we, and we did the same when we went in in 1978, we put in 24 static fermenters, stainless steel fermenters in our winery. But over the years, we realized that in 1888, and before that, in 1865, Clemente Sante had wood fermenters. And guess what? In 1888, that was the first official vintage of Brunello di Montalcino. I don't know if any of you were there. A few of you may have been. But in 1988, at the Italian Trade Commission on Park Avenue, I was there that day. I didn't get a taste of it, but they actually opened a bottle of 1888 Brunello, 100 years old, and deemed that the wine was still drinkable. It was amazing. So our project with Horizon was how could we combine what the Santi, uh, Biondi Santi family brought to the table with what the new innovations were. And what we did was we created the Horizon Project, which starts really from the ground up, but then creates this winery that's a blend of wood and stainless fermenters. Um, we achieve great praise and we're thrilled for all of the praise that we receive for our wines. And our work is truly four decades of research in the Montalcino area. We've even um, looked at the training, the vine training. When we started out in 1978, we trained the vines via Casarsa. Then what we did was we started studying cord and spur. Today, we have since 2002, along with cord and spur, we're not doing Casarsa any longer. Um, we have something called Alborello. Alborello and our uh, cord and spur can be in the same vineyard, even in the same row. And what these training systems do for us is to create what we feel are better quality for our grapes, especially our red grapes. These are three of the Sangiovese clones that we are now typically planting to our vineyards. We found that there's not one super clone, that each of these clones brings something different to the table. Janus' um, clone was named after the first, uh, the Roman god of wine, Janus or Giannis as the Italians say. And Janus 50 is an overall good clone. But we found that when you combine that together with Janus 10 and BF 30, BF after Banfi of course, that what you got was not a good wine every year, but an excellent wine. There was a great question asking if we did whole bunch fermentation. We definitely do not. In fact, we have a sorting system. It goes through hand sorting the bunches and then hand sorting the grapes. We also, in